All right, Jimmy, it's your favorite game, Alphabet Soup, the Centerville edition. Ready? Ready. C is for Centerville, the county seat of Queen Anne's County. E is for the economic development that provides a thriving business community, offering a little something for everyone. N is for never wanting to leave once you visit. T is for tapping into all the artistic talents you'll find inside the Queen Anne's County Center for the Arts. R is for the royal statue that graces the town's courthouse. E is for the good eats you'll find here, Docks Riverside Grill. V is for the variety of brews and spirits you'll find at Bull and Goat Brewery and Old Courthouse Distilling. I is for the interesting history of this centuries old town. L is for the lovely views as you enjoy time at the wharf. L is also for living a healthy lifestyle through programs at the Queen Anne's County YMCA. And E is for how excited we are to bring you Delmarva Life's small town series, Centerville. The ringing of the bells of downtown Centerville, that means it's showtime. It's showtime. Welcome to our small town series from Centerville. I'm Jimmy Hoppe. I'm Lisa Bryant. Uh, Katie, Katie. Oh, hey guys. Get over here. Get over here. Hey. Oh, here I come. You just here. can't. <laughs> We've got to figure out, somebody's got to keep an eye on her. I'm Katie Zarelli. Great Good to, to see, see you. you. And look at where we are. We are right here at the Queen Anne's County Old Courthouse. Fun fact about this, this is the oldest courthouse in Maryland that's still actively used today. Isn't that incredible? I'm sorry, what was that? How old, you ask? Why, thank you for asking. It was built in 1792. Oh, you were just a baby then. <laughs> no. Oh, she got you. <laughs> Seriously, though, you can probably imagine the inside of this courthouse is beautiful, complete with Victorian-era renovations. It's really something to see. And while you're here, make sure your eyes are to the sky. You'll want to check out the eagle that's perched atop the courthouse. As you might expect, the eagle symbolizes America's freedom. Actually, we are right next to what is considered the courthouse green, and sitting pretty in the middle is Queen Anne herself. Her life, though, probably isn't something you'd think of when you hear the word royalty. The queen's life was plagued by illness. She suffered from gout, was considered obese. As a matter of fact, research shows she was carried to her coronation on a chair. Queen Anne so desperately tried to have children, and as she did, but her oldest only lived 11 years. She is said to have had 17 miscarriages. Wow, Queen Anne signed the charter that created Queen Anne's County, so it makes sense that there's a statue here in her honor. It weighs 800 pounds and features the queen on a Queen Anne chair. In fact, yes, there is a connection to Queen Anne and Queen Anne furniture. It's furniture that was designed and developed around the time Queen Anne reigned, 1702 to 1714. Makes sense. Queen Anne furniture often features curved shapes, cushions, seats, and wing-back chairs. Interesting. By the way, our research shows this sculpture of Queen Anne is the only one like it outside of England. And so, you know, we're all about the fun facts, right? So you guys ready for some? Yep. Okay, so why do you think it's called Centerville? Say no more, I will tell you, it's because it is located smack dab in the middle of Queen Anne's County. Oh. How perfect is that? Yeah. Okay. How about, yeah. okay. Any right. ideas on this? This one might be a little bit more tough. Why is it spelled the way it is? C-E-N-T-R-E-ville. Oh, instead of E-R, it's R-E. Yeah, I want to know why. I Thought? do too. I, I think it's I think it's old English for in the middle of everything. Hey, close. It's the French way to spell it. Isn't that fun? Okay, didn't okay. know that. I didn't so, know that either. So there you go. Fun facts all around. So we've talked a little bit about the history. We talked a little bit about what's going on here. I want to explore some modern things, right? Doesn't that sound fun? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to do just that, okay? okay. So I'm going to catch right. up yeah. with you guys in a bit. Okay. I might climb the tree first, though, so. Oh. <laughs> Be careful. Yeah, all yeah. right, see we'll, we'll, No, if you hear any sirens, think nothing of it. It's no big deal. It's okay. <laughs> 
So a lot of that exploring can take place along the beautiful Corsica River. It's a tributary of the Chester River. Go to Centerville Landing. You'll find a, a ramp that provides access to the water for boating, kayaking, fishing, whatever you fancy. Something that's really neat to see along the river, the captain's houses. The four houses rooted in history sit along Corsica Street. They were built around 1880. Schooner captains who utilized the wharf stayed at the captain's houses. Just a cool nugget of history that makes Centerville so unique. Another nugget, the Museum of Eastern Shore Life. Now, if that's not something that everybody on Delmarva should check out, I don't know what is. You're going to find tools used by watermen in years past and antique farm equipment. Certainly a special nod to farmers all over Delmarva. Jimmy, we should definitely check that out before we head home. I think you're right. As a matter of fact, I think we've got a whole lot of things that we need to check out before we head home. And we're going to invite you along for the adventure. You think the historical nuggets that we just covered were cool? Oh, just wait. Up next, we stop by the Queen Anne's Historical Society to give you a better glimpse of this town's rich past. The arts are certainly thriving in Centerville. For four decades, a team at the Queen Anne's County Arts Council has thrown bench strength into creative minds, giving them an outlet to shine. We'll show you. Also going to take a look at the future in Centerville, and that includes an upgrade for the local YMCA, a place that encourages wellness for people who live and live in and visit the town. No way we're visiting a beloved small town without showing off the incredible eats and drinks, and there's absolutely no shortage of them here. If there's one thing you don't want to forget on your trip, it's your appetite, right, Katie? That's right, guys. So if you've got the remote, just toss it here into the Corsica River because you are not going to need it for the next hour. Del Marva Life's small town series, Centerville, will be right back. Del Marva Life is brought to you by Tidal Health. Better together, less duplication, more collaboration. The law offices of Tunnel and Razor, Spicer Brothers Construction, Gateway Subaru, and A and A Companies. The following segments in today's Small Town series are brought to you by the Queen Anne's County Economic and Tourism Development Office. 1794, that's the year this town, Centerville, was incorporated. And now, more than 220 years later, much has changed while some remains the same. The Queen Anne's County Historical Society got started in 1960 with the mission of honoring its roots while moving it forward. Centerville, Maryland is a small town whose heart beats by its people and a community that thrives because of its yesterdays. We have a busy main street, we have beautifully architecturally significant buildings, and we have a history that goes way back. And the Queen Anne's County Historical Society has existed for more than half a century to protect and celebrate that history. Jennifer Moore is the society's president. It's important to make sure that there's a place, a location, multiple locations actually, that we can collect information, be it electronic or in paper originals. Um, some of them are materials that you'll see in the house. Um, there's furniture that's been donated by families who were raised here. And to make sure those things are preserved and collected through um, the ways in which the museums operate. Those museums she's talking about are Tucker House and Wright's Chance. Both are sites with profound historical significance. For instance, Tucker House was actually the second lot established in the town. Each and every person involved with maintaining these longtime landmarks, as well as taking care of other notable artifacts, is doing so voluntarily. We take care of the collections with curatorship. We take care of the grounds themselves with folks who are contractors in the community that donate time to us. Uh, we have folks who work on exhibits who are brilliant at marketing, local architects, local historians, and working with other organizations who are in the same boat we are to make sure that we're all trying to keep our, our roofs over our heads. This house, Wright's Chance, will soon hopefully also serve as a spot for folks to conduct research and in addition have an outdoor space for gathering. Jennifer says for her, she was instilled with volunteerism at a young age and she's passionate about this town. Helping thrust it into the future while remembering the past is a task that takes a village. Paige Tillman is the manager of economic development. We have actually um, 16 historic and relevant sites that we've outlined on a historic trail. It's called the Heritage Trail. And we're very pleased to be able to offer this in conjunction with the Historic Society so that when people come to the town, they can explore these, these sites walking from our main street. 
Speaking of Main Street, the Society is excited to work with the Smithsonian to present Museum on Main Street beginning in mid-June. This effort by the Smithsonian is to bring traveling exhibits to rural communities. And for the first time, it's happening here. We are doing Voices and Votes, and it's on the American democracy. The entire presentation from the Smithsonian will be held at the beautiful Kennard uh, classroom, and then all the surrounding walls within Kennard uh, are going to be a local exhibit. So part of our obligation to do the exhibit is to make sure that we involve the community in the exhibit itself, and how we're doing that is having um, many local community organizations and individuals um, help us to do displays on the walls. The exhibit will last six weeks and is going to bring a number of community organizations together. As you walk in, you're going to see the main Smithsonian exhibit on the floor standing, and then as you walk around the walls, you're going to be able to see our own community on the walls, faces you recognize, stories you've heard, hopefully lessons that you'll learn from reading everything, and we're hoping to have maybe an upwards of 20 organizations participating with us on a local level. Jennifer says the exhibit's opening will coincide with Kennard Heritage Center's Juneteenth celebration. She hopes Voices and Votes has a lasting impact on residents in and around the area. So what you're going to see in the exhibit isn't just please get out and vote during our local elections, but why your voice is important. Mm -hmm. So the organizations are going to be working on historical figures who've made a difference. And we really are at the crossroads of a lot of um, the social and racial um, discrimination as well as in the environmental concerns. So we overlap a lot of issues that have become current again that are very um, important to hear the historic reference and how people uh, came together in past times and were able to accomplish great things. And while bringing this exhibit here will be educational, it'll also hopefully be a boost for the town, too. Some of the things we're hoping to reestablish that the town has, while we may ha not have the same walking traffic as Chestertown and St. Michael's, for example, we have become very good at events. So when we have these events, we're having um, the entire downtown area has been full. We're able to use that hub as a place to, to generate, and we have those side streets. So it gives us a really beautiful spot in town to, to perform and have things go on. I do feel like something like this brings a town momentum mm -hmm. and we get an opportunity to build on that and um, I think we're really looking forward to that. They're building a solid future using pieces of the past here in the present. Again, the exhibit starts on June 12th. It's called Voices and Votes, Democracy in America. And if you want any more information, just head to delmarvalife.com. Well, we're off to the Queen Anne's County Center for the Arts next. Stay with us. The arts are alive in Centerville and thanks in part to this place, the Queen Anne's County Center for the Arts. For more than 40 years, the mission has been to champion performance, visual, and cultural arts. Delmarva Life's Katie's really stepped inside to see how this nonprofit continues to enrich the lives in this part of the peninsula. How would our lives be if art didn't exist? The answer might surprise you. You wouldn't be able to get up and put on a pair of pants. They wouldn't be there. Rick Stritmatter ain't kidding. And that's why he and the rest of the leadership at the Queen Anne's County Center for the Arts believe so much in the nonprofit's mission. It's bringing the arts to our constituents, every demographic, you know, minorities. It just, it's really bringing um, that presence just uh, kind of a universal application of the arts, whether it's classes, uh, concerts, um, exhibitions, whatever, to everyone in Queens County and also people outside of the county. It's a mission that's existed since 1977 and one they accomplish by learning about what people like and dislike and building on that. There is an awareness and although we try to tap in and bring new things to our population in the county. We also want to deliver as far as um, what they like, like, you know, the concerts are really big, you know, and um, some of the outdoor events with food and drink and, you know, it, the idea is to, we don't want to push the arts down anyone's throats, you know. We don't want to say, oh, you've got to do this, you know. We want to find out what they want to do and then we, integrate that with like some new stuff and so far it's worked out really well. Concerts, coffee houses, events, exhibitions, workshops, classes, you name it, they bring it. Even though a lot of this went online through COVID, that didn't slow down the momentum. Queen Anne's County is a very face-to-face -face county, you know, we like to do it in person. So these 
workshops and classes are definitely coming back and people are signing up in droves. I mean, they sign, they sell out in, in you know, an hour, hour or two. It's pretty remarkable. Also remarkable, the various artists you'll find living right here in this area. We have a ton of like writers, uh, visual artists, uh, uh, people in film, animation that have moved over here because it is so, it's, it's still kind of rural and you can still kind of get away from things and now it's so easy to just work from home, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of artists, sculptors, on and on and on over here. And I would say that people really aren't aware that these people are, you know, as part of the population. Rick himself has worked in graphic design, illustration, architectural design, and he's a musician. This is kind of the long haul. It's what I've done since I was old enough to know that I wanted to do it. I was pretty young. He took this job five years ago and was excited to give the organization some new life. It was like poking a sleeping person, you know? I mean, if you're asleep, you're not going to do anything. But when you wake up, you can do all kinds of things. So all of a sudden, you know, we were doing, you know, concerts and, and uh, it, the exhibitions are much bigger. Um, it just opened up a lot of uh, a lot of things that hadn't been done, you know. And um, I have an incredible staff, and we've been able to do, I think, some pretty uh, pretty amazing stuff. And it'll get even more amazing once they complete their annex behind the building. They're currently fundraising for that project. Hopefully, when the building is done, probably within about five years, it will be a uh, place for classes, concerts, more exhibitions, and it will really increase what we can do as far as our outreach. Outreach is important to this organization. They'll do whatever it takes to get art into people's hearts. Our members that we see a lot, they'll come up to me and they'll go, here's so-and-so, she's never been to an exhibition, you know, and she just loves it. She has a great time, you know. And a lot of times it's not your typical uh, accessible art. It may be something really different, you know. Um, and our concert series and plays, and we've got a lot of members that way, new members, you know, would come in and they would be like, yeah, you know, I'm definitely going to do this. This is... Great stuff. And though the art takes center stage, there's often food and drink at exhibits and events that helps bring the fun. It's art, you know, and it's and it's great and it's informative and it's and it's beautiful and it comes from all over. But it's also a bit of a party. And Rick says those parties will hopefully pop back up sometime soon. Things are getting back to normal and people are I think they're really looking forward to getting out and having a good time. Having a good time while celebrating arts of all kinds created here in Centerville and beyond. Now, the experiences and opportunities that you just heard about inside are all made possible through the contributions and the donations made by members and friends. If you would like to be a part of it, all you have to do is get the information from downmarvelife.com. Right now, this is just an empty field across 304 from Queen Anne's County High School, but soon it will be the home to the new Queen Anne's Family YMCA. And there is a lot of buzz about it in Centerville. I stopped by the current facility to find out what we can expect in the new Y. Queen Anne's County got its first YMCA in 2015, taking over the space that was once a commercial fitness center. But now it's time to grow. Currently we serve about 944 members. We have about 2,000. Um, and with the new building, we're really slated to see a huge growth. Just getting the Y opened in this facility took lots of legwork. I remember when I first moved here, uh, 2007, uh, I was out at the Queen Anne's County Fair passing out flyers um, as part of this project about a future YMCA in, in Queen Anne's County. And uh, I distinctly remember uh, everyone dropping their flyers, saying this will never happen, and so it's been a long process. The current facility limits what the Y can offer. In fact, big programs like summer camp take place off-site. We um, are partnered with the Gunston School, 
and then the Corsica River Sailing Center. The camps are offered to children ages 5 to 12. Sailing and base studies and Bill Nye, the camp science guy, and different themes for the kids to choose from. The pandemic canceled camps last summer, but Victoria says registration for summer 21 camp brought in more than 400 kids. So it's really putting us in a good spot. Once the new facility is completed, those camps will be on site. Being in your own home branch with camp, you know, the kids going in and out of the hallways and going to the swim pool or going outside to the field to play volleyball. Um, and the members also interacting and doing their exercise and healthy living as well. I think it's great to just have all, all those programs at one spot and one location. The new building will have a swimming pool, something the current facility doesn't have. In fact, it will be the only pool in the area. On the eastern shore, you're surrounded by water. And so if you, uh, if you think about especially the number of kids that we have in each of our communities and uh, the low number of those individuals who actually know how to swim, uh, it's exciting to think that a YMCA can be added in uh, with an asset like a pool where we can help close the gap on some of the, that swim lesson instruction or the inability to, to learn to swim on the eastern shore. Including the pool was an obvious choice when planning the new facility, but Derek says there are other features that may not seem so obvious. When you think about a YMCA work, sometimes you think sports, uh, you think about wellness, uh, but for us as well, there's uh, chronic disease programs. So serving people uh, with cancer survivors, uh, people with balance and stability issues, Parkinson's. Uh, so you try and think of, when you're thinking of a facility, what uh, assets could you put in that facility that would help lift up those individuals as well. It will even include a business development center. There we will work on complementing small businesses. How can we offer resources to uh, new uh, startup businesses that may be hard to manage as they launch? And so if you think about uh, maybe access to um, an HR director, maybe a small business doesn't have that and needs some consultation around uh, how to handle a tough conversation with an employee, then uh, maybe that's something you'll see in the Small Business Development Center. Derek says the buzz around the new YMCA is growing. People are seeing the renderings of the new facility. Uh, they know that we're meeting uh, with uh, planning and zoning and uh, meeting with commissioners. And so uh, it's, it, it, there really is some excitement building, especially on social media. You see, you see people starting to talk about now that the warmer weather has br uh, broken and we're getting a little bit out of our uh, COVID funk. Uh, people are, are ready to see this uh, new YMCA take shape and, uh, and see some of the building come out of the ground. Groundbreaking is scheduled for early June and is expected to be completed in late 2022. It'll be located on 304 across from the high school. One of the things that I'm most excited about is the proximity to kids. Uh, we, as our YMCA's have grown, we have realized that building on school property or close to schools is, is really an asset to all communities. That will give students a safe and fun place to engage and thrive. Having endless opportunities for our youth in the community really just is going to be a lot for everyone, I think. And as you can see, there's plenty of room to grow here and the Y plans on that growth. They say they want to incorporate an outdoor water park in phase two. That is unless they reach their fundraising goal in phase one. We shall see. Well, there are plenty of things to eat and drink in Centerville, and we're going to dig in as we continue our small town series. Be sure and stick around. We'll be right back. We hope you're enjoying exploring Centerville with us, and it's time now to really give you a taste of the seat of Queen Anne's County. We're going to do so here at Bull and Goat Brewery and Old Courthouse Distilling. Three entrepreneurs, two operations, one roof. It all started five years ago, and since then, it's been growing and flowing. It was 2016 when longtime friends Jacob Heimbuck and Jeff Putman got the buzz for brewing beer. We started to think to ourselves, well, we could probably make a run at this. And uh, we had a nice spot. It was much smaller than this, 300 square feet. And we went ahead and uh, got that uh, leased. And uh, we worked with the town to change the zoning laws and started a little brewery. The two fell in love with the culture of the drink after having visited numerous beer scenes and hot spots throughout the country. 
Starting their own operation took trial and error, but the product was something consumers quickly craved. The town wanted it, and uh, it just from there, it's from one barrel to two barrel, two barrel to seven, and I think we're getting ready to, to bump an expansion here in the next year as well. So They named the brewery after each other in a way. You know, he's a bit older than I am, so I always call him an old goat. You know, I kind of am head first and ask questions later, and he calls me the bull because of that. So There it is. Not long after these suds saw success, Jacob, or Jake, connected with another lifelong friend, Jason Guest, to bring spirits into the mix. Jake says, do you want to start, do you want to start making whiskey? And I was like, yeah, I definitely want to start making whiskey. It was a natural uh, progression, really. I mean, you're pretty much when you're distilling, you're starting off with a, a wort, uh, what you do with beer, and then they actually call it uh, the beer that uh, you make and you ferment, and then the next step is distilling. So it's a pretty natural transition. And so old courthouse distilling was born. These spirits, of course, have to age, so it'll be a bit before tasting time. But in the meantime, they're sourcing bourbon from a different distillery out in Indiana. We buy it by the barrel. Uh, we buy rye whiskey from them, too. And uh, we bring it in and uh, cut it and bottle it here ourselves. Um, and we actually, you can, you can make it your own. So we, we just recently picked up a uh, sherry barrel. Um, and we took a rye whiskey, and it was a three-year-old rye, and we're finishing it in the sherry barrel. And from there, uh, we'll probably do a big release um, later this year, probably right before Christmas. Another project that took some time, creating this tap room where people can come together to sit and sip. When we first had it, I mean, it was a, just a, you know, there was no outside patio. Uh, we'll show you a beer garden. There was no, um, you know, outside deck. But we turned it into something a bit more. And uh, every, every year, really, we continue to add on and uh, we continue to, honestly, we'd probably do focus a lot of our efforts on this tap room because we've learned to love it. And it's, we meet a lot of cool people. We love uh, the town and uh, it's been a lot of fun just, you know, getting to know everybody and becoming part of the community's life. The tap room presents local flavors of a different kind too, by displaying unique pieces of art done right here in the area. And for food, they'll serve up charcuterie boards all right. Security plates. So now, what we have here. Yeah. Um, so, Saperset, Pursuit, Capicola. Mm -hmm. uh, these are dried prunes, oh. crostinis, salted walnuts, pickles, uh, stone wheat crackers, honey mustard, brie, uh, cheddar, gouda, and a Bella Vuitton Merlot cheese. Um, here's the deal. How does one choose? Uh, uh, you know what I like to do is yeah. mix it all together. Mix it all together. That are pleasing to every palate. Bon appetit. Mmm, I like that. Lots of flavors going on. <laughs> this is amazing. Combine it with a margarita or any one of their beers. From lager to IPA, they do it all. And what you taste the first time won't change the second time. Being able to recreate that beer. So we're very attentive to temperatures, uh, mash bills, yeah, fermentation color, temperatures. And it's very hard to do with two barrel batch. Um, not so hard to do with a seven. And the bigger you get, the easier it is to recreate. And when it comes to getting bigger, these guys have thoughts. For me, it's more about um, just organic growth and not growing too fast and making sure that we can control our growth and you know having a good time while doing it. Because the thing is with this, for me, it's you know I have a job. This is not a job. And when it does become a job, you know, then I'll probably be bummed out because <laughs> I want to be able to do what I want when I want to do it. So I, I like the size we're at and I like the growth that we uh, are achieving. I mean, I like the idea of growing, but I also like the idea of, of being really proud of what you're doing and, and making something really good that's really important to you. So I, th I think as you scale up, that kind of gets lost. So it's nice having a small area and having small you know, not having a, a, a ton of whiskey and a ton of, uh, of alcohol and, and making really good stuff. We're concentrating on our counties, our five counties around us, where we live. And until we can master that market, and we are very well represented in this market, um, I don't suspect we'll endeavor to grow um, 
because we have, we have so much potential here. And besides, we want to make the tap room the spot as well. So we'd, we would rather try to grow the tap room than our distribution footprint. These guys are truly committed to pumping out a perfect product. Just wait till you see them in action. We're gonna learn more about the day-to-day -day operations of both businesses next. Stay with us. Before the break, we introduced you to the partners of Bull & Go Brewery and Old Courthouse Distilling. Two businesses under one roof bringing big tastes to Centerville. But making these brews and spirits is a tall task. Let's learn more about how it all happens. When it comes to the creation of brews and spirits, every day is different. So we did the milling yesterday. Today, this morning, we actually uh, brought it over here, mashed it out, stuck it in the boil kettle, boiled it out, which you just missed. And uh, what you're gonna see now is us transferring it into... Jeff Putman walks us through just a portion of the intricate process that is making beer. We use a series of glycol, and water to chill this beer. We use glycol to chill water, water to chill beer. Here at Bull & Go, they use a seven gallon system to make numerous unforgettable flavors. Jeff says what can be challenging about it is, as the brewer, you don't always have control. When you ferment beer, you're on the beer's time. So, I mean, if it's gonna be ready at five o'clock, you have to shut it down at five o'clock that day. If it's the next day, you gotta be ready to do it the next day. So. That you have to be a little flexible in. This is also the part where we aerate the beer, oxygenate. Every single so step is done with precision so that no matter how many times they brew a batch, the flavor is still the same. We consistently make a product that people can come back to. So we have a half a dozen beers that never go off tap. And although we're only a seven barrel system, our consistency is such that we can recreate those beers seven barrels at a time. When it comes to whiskey, it's work too. So uh, right here we've got a, uh, this is a bourbon mash, a sour bourbon mash. We went ahead, this has a few hundred pounds of grain, um, about 60 or 70 gallons of water. It's been fermenting for um, about a week now. Um, it was a really, really good starting gravity, which means it's gonna have an awesome alcohol content. So what we're gonna do is uh, pretty much bucket this out and then put it through a wine press so that we can collect all of the liquid. What happens is a cake forms on top. We're gonna to take this cake off and then we're gonna to start to get the rest of the liquid. The liquid's what we're after. Of course, this spirit requires aging. It needs to age for at least two years to be called a straight, well, when we make a bourbon, it needs to be aged for at least two years and then you can call it a straight bourbon. Um, after four years, you can call it a bourbon without an age statement. So it's a pretty messy process and certainly not what the big boys do. But uh, it's how we've learned to do it. And we're pumping out about, uh, I don't know, probably about 50 to 60 gallons or about a barrel a year of whiskey. And the exciting thing is we don't even get to see what this tastes like for about uh, four to six more years. As the saying goes, patience is a virtue. I asked these guys how they're so willing to wait. It's just a labor of love that you just kind of you get excited about it and then you let it age and then you, you taste it every once in a while and, and, and see how it's coming along and, and you just kind of build up anticipation until it's done. Safe to say when their first barrel is ready to go, cheers. What's gonna wind up happening is we're gonna drink it all ourselves and no one's gonna get any. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just really neat knowing that you, 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 you mashed it, you distilled it, you barreled it, you bottled it and this is yours. And what's theirs then becomes everyone's to enjoy. And just in case you're wondering, although it's more often than not a smooth operation, messes happen. I mean, he blew up a barrel once. That was awesome. I mean, yeah, things happen. Things, they do happen. Yeah, you're going to, I mean, it's, things will go wrong. Yeah, and that's okay. Yeah, there's always the next batch. Bull & Goat is one of four breweries here in Queen Anne's County, and Old Courthouse Distilling is one of two distilleries. And Jake says that is great for bringing folks from away to this area. And if you want to know any more about what goes on back here, just head to DelmarvaLife.com. Well, we are heading to Doc's Riverside Grill next. Stay with us. I think we have a, quite the day of enjoying the sights and the sounds of Centerville. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Here's my thought. I think it's time to press 
pause. And when it comes time to relaxing and unwinding, there's no place like Doc's Riverside Grill. Yeah, whether you uh, want a quick drink mm -hmm. or you want to bring the family on a Friday night or perhaps you want to grab a bite while watching the game, you will be welcomed like family. And since its inception in 2006, it's a restaurant where everyone is welcomed with open arms and soon known by their name. You can't have a quaint town without a sort of gathering place. You know, that spot where the gents meet up to chat news and politics. Friends take the edge off together after a long week at work, or the family comes in so mom doesn't have to make a meal. For the last decade and a half, Doc's Riverside Grill has proudly been that place. Oh yeah, it's been 16 years now. I mean, the community is great. Bo Oristian and his wife Diane came to this area after having run a restaurant in Manassas, Virginia for 20 years. Diane's family roots were here, and they wanted to be, too. Their first thought was to open a restaurant in Chestertown. But the road led them elsewhere. I kind of got lost, and, and coming back, I noticed this restaurant as we drove by. He talked to who he needed to talk to, and soon it was theirs. And from day one, Doc's Riverside Grill has based their business on caring for their customers in a way that stands out. Well, we appreciate your business. We go that extra mile. We, you know, what you need, we're willing to do. If it needs to go pick you up, drop you off food, do whatever it takes, that's what we do. Chip Gregory was once a doubter, and now he's a regular. I thought, you have a sports bar in Sutterville? <laughs> I don't know about that. And uh, it just was amazing what he did. Chip and Tom Wright are part of a crew that comes in daily to chat. Tom says the food's great, but it's the way they lead with love that truly fills him. <laughs> just the way they treat people, you know. They've had fundraisers, and that's the ideal. I've seen some really nice fundraisers down here for some really good causes. They have general manager Dana Musterman to thank for that. While she's responsible for the day-to-day -day duties, she's also taken on the role of Mother Hen. It's great because it is like family, so it's, it's a little chaotic at times, but I do it because I love them. Um, I get a lot of support from the customers, believe it or not. We have the best staff. Part of that staff includes the squad in the kitchen. This loyal crew has been with them since the days in Virginia. They pump out plates full of flavors to satiate and satisfy. All right, time to give these seafood nachos a try. These have shrimp, scallop, and crab. And I'll be honest, the smell already has me sold, so I can't even imagine what the taste is going to be. But here we go. I'm going to get a little dip. We're going to go for it. Mm. That sauce is like creamy. That is delicious. I could see myself just eating this whole plate, no problem. Doc's is named after Bo's late father. Shoot. Um, he passed away just before uh, we opened. And, uh, Doc was a family man who knew the value of hard work. So he named it after my dad, and um, he was he lived long enough to see the pictures of it before we had named it, so. Uh... No doubt if he saw it now, he'd be proud of what his son and daughter-in-law have done and continue to do. Bo comes in, he did dishes last week. Diane works every day. If I call her and say we're short here, she comes in and she just goes wherever. Mm -hmm. She has to wash a dish, she'll do a dish. Absolutely. Um, you don't get owners like that. Helps that they're partners in life, too. She, she's my best friend. She's my best friend. 42 years and I met, that's how I got in the restaurant business. I met her in the restaurant business. I was a night cook and she came in and she was a senior in high school and it's been, um, it's beautiful. Don't get me crying again. What they've built here is beautiful, too. A place that, for folks in and around Centerville, serves as a second home. An atmosphere money can't buy, and one they most certainly didn't create alone. I'm very fortunate. See, people think I'm so smart. I'm, I'm fortunate. I got good people around me, and you're only as good as the people that work with you. And I've been very, very fortunate. And that fortune means food, fun, and fellowship that folks around here will remember forever.
And Docs has two other locations, one in Easton and one in Oxford. And the family also owns legal assets in Easton. There you go. Del Marble Live Small Town Series Centerville. I'll tell you what, guys, there's so much that I'm not going to forget about our, my experience here in Centerville. Right. But those seafood nachos from Docs, I got to get those Good again. Stuff. Those were incredible. And hey, speaking of Docs, they're watching. They've got a watch party going on. So, hey, everybody at Docs. Hey, guys. <laughs> All right, I tell you what, we sure did pack a lot of stuff into this show. And if you would like to watch it again, you can tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. on our sister station, Fox 21. And you got to make sure you check out all our behind the scenes stuff because we have fun off camera, right, guys? Well, maybe a little. <laughs> maybe, maybe, they do. They're maybe. wild. So just uh, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're all over them. Yeah. You know? Don't think she doesn't do it, too. But <laughs> first, you hear that? Yeah. We're creeping up on 6 o'clock. It's time to turn the microphones over to everybody in the Newsplex because they've got everything you need to know as far as the news, weather, and sports with WBOC News. Have a great evening. Make sure you get some rest. Visit Centerville, and we'll see you tomorrow. Where's Docs? Docs. <laughs>